Okay. If the last one that are leaving now and the rest can sit, please give a big round of applause to the directors of the film, Reach, Rachel Leah Jones and Philip Baiche, and to Leah Tsemel. So thank you for this very interesting, beautiful film. Thank you also, Lea, to be here with us. It's a great, great honor. Um, so I've heard that the three of you known each other for already a long time. So maybe someone can close the door. That would be really great. Um, so what made you think we have to make this movie right now? Or when did it start it? Uh, how long was the process? So you're right, uh, we uh, separately, we've been knowing Leah a long time ago, and I will uh, speak for myself. I, I, people in, also in the press and in the documentary world know about Leah, yeah. not a bit, as someone that would come help you as a, as a journalist, if you have, if you encounter any a problem with the police or with the army. Yeah. And so when I begin to work in this field some 20 years ago in Israel, someone gave me a phone number with a name Leah. Yeah. And told me, okay, this is the this is a lawyer. If you think that the the authorities are telling you you cannot film, but you know that you can, mm. you should insist. But if you got into trouble, just call this <laughs> number. Yeah. Okay. How and soon a, did you have to call? I never had to call. You never had to call. Ah. Never had to call, huh? but the, the, to, to have the phone number in my pocket was, you know, yeah. just like the... Just the, the daughter said. Just like just, Dembo, yeah. The, yeah. The, flying, um, yeah. a, the flying elephant, mm. you know. <laughs> and and uh, a few years after, uh, two, three years after, mm. uh, by chance, I was invited by a, a film director to a dinner at Leah and her husband, Michelle. And on the way, she told me all about Leah and that she's a human rights lawyer defending Palestinians, even those who had made uh, big uh, actions. And, <clears throat> and I was on my way, I was imagining to meet someone very grave, stern, uh, holding on her shoulder all the, all the pain, if not of the... Of the yeah of the humanity of the Palestinian people on her shoulders. Mm. And I <laughs> and met... You saw she's just hosting you. Exactly. Like, yeah, thank you. And exactly. <laughs> and I saw someone completely uh, curious of others, asking everybody around the table, uh, uh, curious of them, asking them who they are, and absolutely not a, a grave, a, and absolutely not speaking about her work. Mm. And when I asked her finally um, uh, why she wanted me about her work, she told me it's very simple. Uh, the Palestinian can be defended. Mm -hmm. If they can be de defended, then they have to be defended. And if they have to be defended, they must be defended. And I'm one of the lawyers who's doing that. Yeah. And did you know, Rich, did you know each other already then? No, we didn't know each other. And a few years <laughs> after, I met Rachel. Yeah. And Rachel knew uh, Lea yeah, and Michelle a little more than me, more, yeah. more intimately. And I told, uh, I told uh, Rachel, well, it's, Lea is an incredible uh, um, uh, character for a documentary. <laughs> so we should make a movie about her. And, and Rachel told me, no, no. We, Why we, no, we, Rachel? Okay, somebody will make a movie about her one day, and then that day never came. And okay. and one okay. day we we knew we we understood that Leah was going to to get to have a, a her seventieth birthday, yeah. and it's when I told Rachel, look, we have Leah one day, even though she will say to you no, but one day Leah will stop working. <laughs> we have we some we yeah. have to document her. In her work. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, Leah, could you please take the mic? <laughs> Great. 
My turn. So, yeah, were you immediately exciting about this idea, these people following you all the time in your work? Excited, how to say. Yeah. I agreed. I said, yeah. okay, yeah. if that's what you want, go ahead. And Let how long, how, <laughs> what? <laughs> is, is there a mic on, this mic? Yeah, okay. Yeah. It was worse yeah. than that. She oh. said, follow me. What do I do? It's boring. <laughs> I go from the office mm -hmm. to the court, from the court to the office. Good luck. <laughs> Good. And then, because the two cases that are central in the movie are, of course, uh, well, well, were they coincidence that those two cases were at the moment you were filming, or did you very particular choose those two cases? It was very coincidental. We started okay. filming in the beginning of 2015. Uh, we had it in mind 2015, that so 20, four years ago, so, yeah. yeah, roughly four or five, almost five years ago, January, we were testing it. May, we filmed the guy, um, the case that opens the film. We thought that might be a good case to follow. It closed in a plea bargain within two or three sessions, so that was not a case to follow. We had initially thought that we would primarily base it on her past cases, that maybe the heyday was... <laughs> behind us, and then a new moment in Israel-Palestine erupted. Um, they've given it different names, the Intifada of the children, Intifada of the women, Intifada of the individuals, of the knives. It doesn't really matter what they call it. But it was a new moment where there was resistance, and that resistance was not orchestrated. It was not politically led. It was um, individual acts of great desperation. And gr uh, it, was a, it was an expression of people being just utterly fed up and despondent. And the woman and the kid were part of that wave. Yeah. Those cases came into Leah's office and we saw how she responded to them and we followed them. We followed some other cases okay. too. Yeah. It was complete coincidence that the two of them were sentenced not only on the same day but really yeah. within the same hour, really back to back. Yeah. Um, so we were, as yeah, they documentarians, are each other's yeah. path, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. As documentarians, we were grateful that we had made the choice to follow them both. They were not the only cases we followed, mm. but finally we chose to focus on those two. And Philip, did you immediately know that you wanted to kind of portray Leah also in the context of her, her history and the Israeli-Palestinian history? Yeah, this was the original idea. Yeah. It was to, to tell, uh, uh, to tell through uh, past cases both the story of Leah and how begin her uh, engagement and and what happened to her and this this is why we choose those cases where either she's pregnant or hmm. except or she had uh, her very first and uh, a, a trial and when she when they have a kid etc. Like and key moments in the... Yes, yeah, yeah. but it was also a way to um, a, try to find different type of defenses, of different yeah. type of, uh, of um, things that have been re reimprehensible. Yeah. Okay. And, and so to give a little bit of a, a story of the, of the uh, Palestinian resistance and how they are being um, a dealt in court. Mm. And also what we discovered making it is that we were also um, a giving a hint of the story, long uh, uh, history of the um, solidarity between Israeli Jews and Yeah, I thought it was very interesting. I thought I knew something, but I had never heard of Matzepin, for, of course, of, uh, so it was very interesting. Um, Leah, you explain in several different times why you do what you do. But then I saw uh, that at a quite young age, uh, you saw this exile of Palestinians and it immediately reminded you of this image you have of Jews in exile. You make this connection between yourself and the Palestinians. And there's always this discussion, but I think I really wanted to ask you, do you think that Israelis with their past have a kind of extra moral obligation how they treat the other? Yeah, the answer is, of course, it goes without saying, I think. Well, for uh, some it both goes. Both the, the uh, Jewish heritage and the history, yeah. uh, let alone the Holocaust, I, I, I feel that we are obliged, of course, yes. 
we, we speak at ourselves as the chosen people, and we, we call it Nibu Or Lagoyim, the light to the Gentiles, the light to the mm. world. I think I, I have uh, acquired this concept, probably, <laughs> because that's what I really think we should be. That light. And I, I know you're not alone in this, in Israel, but you are with a very small percentage. But you grew up in the same state. Can you, do you have an explanation for that? Why, why did your... Why did it happen to me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it appears in the movie a bit. First of all, I thought, I think I was a very average uh, Israeli Zionist uh, who lived in... Uh, in a, a very Zionist house, yeah. normal Zionist house, and then uh, the war occurred. And all of a sudden, there were questions that had no answer. The refugee problem, the original refugee problem, what is going on now in 67, I realized, it took me some time, I was a student in Jerusalem, to realize that Israel does not search for peace at all. And uh, Little by little, I woke up to this reality, and the, the demonstration that you saw in the university helped yeah. really to raise the questions, and the answers were there. Yeah. I have so many questions, and they may look, they're a little bit random, but I'm just going to point them randomly at you. So I thought, the clients that you have, are they also appointed to you? It, it, it wasn't very clear to me, or do, is everyone coming to you because of your name? How does it work? Uh, many are coming because of the name yeah. of the, you know, it's almost 50 years of doing yeah. those works. Uh, some are, in the last 20 years, we have a public defense system. Yeah. So some come through the public defense system. And usually it's a mouth to ear in the prison or something like that. Yeah, so, so yeah. mostly people come to you. Or different yeah. human rights organizations, yeah. but that's yeah. the... And I was thinking, like, are there also such high-profile Palestinian lawyers like you, or is that a very naive question of me? Can they do their no, work? No, there are. There, there are, are, and there are very good lawyers. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, many years ago, it was very difficult for a Palestinian lawyer to take a case of a terrorist, because mm. immediately, automatically, he would be considered also a terrorist. So it was much easier for me. Yeah. Uh, being an Israeli Jew to defend those cases. But little by little, also Palestinian uh, young lawyers, Israeli Palestinians, yeah. or from the occupied territories in military courts, could afford themselves to take these cases yeah. and uh, fight for them. And when you were, uh, when you were a lawyer uh, based in the West Bank, do you, do you have the same freedom to do your work as you do when there is a no, okay, of no, course, again, of course, no. again, it's very clear that each and every Arab lawyer yeah. is being treated with some question mark. Yeah. It depends how devoted he is to his clients. Yeah. And uh, there are cases where um, lawyers have been suspected of identifying with the clients too much. Yeah. And they would have some obstacles in their daily work, for sure. Some are limited, they cannot visit prison very often. Mm. Um, we had recently lawyers who were brought to trial because they were collaborating with the clients or passing um, information from one yeah. prison to another, Arab but, lawyers. Yeah, maybe let's get to that, because the, your close colleague that we see in the film, Tarek Bargut, um, so here in the subtitles we see that he was, uh, uh, how do you say that? Um, not, he was arrested, but yeah. he wasn't. He, but yeah. then I, uh, I, I looked for some background information, and I found this article on Haaretz, an uh, Israeli newspaper, that he was now uh, convicted and he has complied. Is it for you possible to say something about this? Yes, of course. Okay. It's a must. You must, yes. Yeah. If you realized, uh, I think nobody meant it, but that's how it happened, that the, fil the film is following the conflicts that raise between lawyers, between concepts, between attitudes, how would we run the cases? Yeah. And the uh, pessimistic lawyer was uh, Tarek. He said, 
Don't search for justice there. There's no justice. No. It will not happen. He was um, trying to um, put more pressure to get to some kind of a plea bargain rather than really carry out the trials. Yeah. And uh, later on... Was he, always can, was he always like this or did you thought, well, is, he's going through a transformation or something? No. Uh, later on we realized uh, that he was representing many, many youngsters in the West Bank yeah. mainly who were detained. Some of them were killed while trying to stab a soldier or threaten at uh, a soldier. And um, as he said later on, he used to be responsible for bringing the corpse of those youngsters from the West Bank into, the, into Israel to the, to the Israel. families. And uh, it affected him very much. Yeah. It really affected him very much. And you can see also during the film itself, at the end, when the punishments are imposed, when we uh, fail to acquit the young child, yeah. he, he is really hurt, it, he couldn't bear it. No. And as a reaction, we found out much later, only after we, the premiere of the film, yeah. he was detained and uh, we realized that uh, um, a spontaneous reaction to the verdicts yeah was uh, going and shooting at that same uh, roadblock where he used to get the corpse of the youngsters, to receive the corpse of the youngsters, and later on tried to make some uh, military, quasi-military operations without any injuries uh, in order to deter the settlers from continuing the, uh, the settlement process. Yeah. Would, so he was sentenced. Would, yes, yeah. what, that's a last word. He was sentenced to 13 years and a half in prison. He started to serve it. Yeah. Were yeah. you personally hurt or not? Um, hurt. I feel sorry uh, on one hand, and I honor him on the other hand. You what? You honor, honor him. him. Okay. Yeah. His colleagues, for the most part, defined it as burnout. His wife defined it as a kind of a nervous breakdown. Yeah. And in conversations with Leah, she defined it maybe as some kind of survivor's guilt. You play your part unwittingly in sending so many people away into prison, even though you're there to defend them, but you're also part of the machinery yeah. of the system that puts people away almost automatically, yeah. people who he felt could have been his nieces, his nephews, his daughters, his sons, his aunts, his uncles, and at some point, Leah said that he probably said to himself, I'm no better than they are. Mm -hmm. But it's not a, not for any of us was it a simple reality to face. I don't think, I know, not I don't think, I know that none of us Imagine the degree to which he felt despondent and desperate and despaired. Yeah. Um, nobody saw it coming. I thought because he was obviously so disillusioned, but then I also saw your other former colleague at the, uh, um, what's his name, Av, Avi, Avigovi, and he also says, like, I don't believe in justice, but Leah does. And, yeah. and then you say, well, I don't believe I'm going to change uh, the, the court, the justice system. What, how, and how do you keep such optimistic rebel with a lost cause? I'm, I, I think it's the only way, I believe. It's not nothing that I'll calculate it. That's what's going on in this country where I was born, where I grew up, where I intend to stay and have my family. <laughs> So justice must come about sometime, someday. And if that's the situation, I have to continue. But it, it must also be your personality because there are so little people that can deal with so, ma so much disappointments on a, is it? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's your superpower. <laughs> no, or no. stupidity, who yeah. knows? <laughs> um, a little bit about the film. Um, I was thinking because I saw that the film had like many 
uh, producers and funds. And there were also uh, some Israeli uh, funding. And we had discussions actually in this venue before um, how you deal with this Israeli funding, whether uh, funding for those critical documentaries and art projects can be seen as a result that Israel is still kind of a, a function democracy, or that it's this kind of window dressing and whether you have to make use of these funds or not. Was this, has he, have you think, thought about this? And no, we certainly contemplated whether it was appropriate to take public money for this film in Israel. <laughs> And after some contemplation and maybe even some difference of opinion, we both understood that it was. And the reason that we understood that it was is because our protagonist is an Israeli Jew. And she is as much a part of, let's say, I'll put it this way, every reality has a sub-reality. And there's always been a sub-reality of Israeli Jews who have been critical of the regime, who have wanted a better life for everybody living in that land. And it's a minority narrative, but it's been a consistent narrative throughout. And it's a legitimate narrative in Israeli reality. Um, so we thought, well, why should we censor ourselves? We should be censored, we shouldn't censor ourselves. And we found partners in an Israeli private channel, in an Israeli public film fund, and I, feel that it's really important for us in Israel, maybe less so here, to make the distinction between public money and government money. So it wasn't a government fund? The, the, because I saw something Public like money <coughs> is government yeah. money, but it doesn't belong to the ruling government. It belongs to the public, even if those of us didn't vote for that government. Mm -hmm. We are taxpayers. It's our civil rights mm -hmm. to access monies to tell the kinds of stories that we want to tell. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we will apply. If we get the money, we'll use it. If we don't get the money, we'll say, okay, we're being censored one way or another. And we weren't. It complicates things. It means that reality isn't singular. There's a dominant narrative, which we don't share, but there's also a minority narrative that in some ways identifies with the kind of world that we would like to see. And that makes life more complicated, but complicated is good. Yeah, yeah I want to add here yeah, yeah. something. For one, I think we wouldn't have begin mm -hmm. this project without the support of an Israeli channel. We, it's the first channel that I get in, was the, the Israeli channel. Yeah. And it, it gave, I mean, we needed it to, to know that we were going to make this, this movie. And we found them very easily. And when, come, when, it, when, when, it, and when we went to the fund, mm -hmm. the, which is a public fund, yeah. the, the channel is a private channel, but the fund is a public fund, Again, the people there don't, uh, don't feel that they're serving the government. Mm -hmm. They're feeling that they're serving the, 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 the culture, the, rep the, the public, the democracy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you, you, I mean, when you ask your question, you know, well, I would, I would like to, to let, I mean, to, I mean we, now you, we can have the same, you know, with movies from many countries, but you, we, we need to realize that there might be people in Israel that will use now not that that, my, that our movie has been made, mm -hmm. and it has been made with public fund. So there might be people who will use this fact mm -hmm. in, in a cynical way, as you say, as a vitrina. Mm -hmm. as a, okay? yeah. But it, I, absolutely, I will say absolutely not. The, peop, the people who are at the funds had this in mind, that we would need to have um, a leftist movie for us to be a vitrina. They, they did it because they believed in this movie yeah. and they believe that what we are saying in this film also has to be uh, said most of, uh, um, has to be said first of all inside Israel, mm -hmm. not thinking very much about the world. So how has the movie been received in Israel? Has it been shown also on the West Bank? Gaza? Uh, have you been screening not it? Yet, so. We premiered about six months ago at the Israeli Documentary Film Festival, yeah. Doka Viv, um, and we were kind of blown away. It, was, it, it defied our expectations 
Before the festival began, the three screenings had sold out. They added a fourth screening, it sold out. We won the festival. They added a fifth screening, it sold out. Over the course of one week, some 2,000 Israeli Jews saw the, fe saw the film. Standing ovations, people were really, um, really embraced it. Um, we were surprised. You were surprised. We yeah. did not imagine that kind of reception. There was a moment where we looked at each other and said, are we, are we in Israel? What's going on here? No, no, no. Um, we didn't, no it was not. not that. But we could not imagine the thirst <coughs> of the public mm -hmm. for such narrative. We could mm -hmm. not because, I mean, what you hear from Israel, you're hearing from media, and it's very far, but even us for in the last five, ten years, mm -hmm. we're feeling that there's a shrinking, uh, the, the, uh, the space for, for debating and, and speaking is shrinking, okay. and that you can less easily. So we, uh, what uh, we sorry, encountered do you, was... Do you, do you feel that this space is limited, limited in, in Israel, or also when you go abroad, that there is... In Israel, I'm in speaking Israel, now yeah. in yeah. Israel. No. Yeah. I would actually say that in Israel, it used to be, for us at least mm -hmm. as Israeli Jews, the most comfortable place to be critical of Israel was, in fact, in Israel. And I think that's definitely changed. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that people embraced the film was it somehow represented for them the ability to reclaim some of the space that had been lost. Yeah. Um, and so, but a few weeks after we won the festival, the Minister of Culture came out against the film. Um, a right-wing vigilante group came out against the film. There was pressure to take away the prize money that we oh, had wow. gotten. Um, it was one of the two prize monies that we got was in fact taken away. But then we were surprised again. All of the arts community um, stood up for the film, stood, out, stood up for the possibility of having these kinds of narratives, um, for having some kind of ideological the pluralism. The first channel. And, the, and the fun was reinstated. So and then again we got censored. I mean, it's been, it's been a bit of a ping pong, um, but I would have to say at the end of this wild uh, ride that yeah. we've been on, um, the powers that be are continuing to be against the film, but the people are speaking and the uh, solidarity is surprisingly broad. Um, so like I said before, every reality has a sub-reality. Yeah. Yeah, it was and, not only artists who were fighting for the you know, for um, freedom for of expression, or freedom yeah. of expression, it, you know, freedom of mm. arts. Yeah. It was even more the civil society who okay. was speaking about freedom of expression. In any case, because if there were some uh, um, institution mm. that that came and said, or individuals mm. came and said, if a, a the national lottery who was supposed to yep. to give the fund will not give it, then we will give it. Yeah. We will give, we will, we will replace them. And it came from all over, yeah. and it was, it, it was, and it's still surprising because the, the Minister of Culture, since she, that she's not stopping her, um, a, a, I mean, her, her, her at, attempts to, mm -hmm. to, to stop the screening of the movie, mm. each time so far, we got the same a solidarity movement, and even more people want to see the film. So, Last, and, but did you show it also in the West Bank, or not yet? We have invitations for screenings okay. in Bethlehem and Ramallah, yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. We've, we're taking it slow. We've been very focused on the international circuit. Yeah. But the invitations exist, and the screenings will happen, yes. Well, before I go to the audience for some questions, I just have this concern, Leah, because we have all these images of your office, and I saw all this paper, and I thought, is nothing digitalized? And, and if this moment comes that you want to decide to stop working, and there's this new generation, yeah, it, how will they...? <laughs> it, no, it's a great uh, question, because we are, we've thought about it when we were a, on the second phase of the movie and looking into her archives to do the past cases, and then we understood that we need to find some institution or some fund who will take on the, the scanning of all her facts, because there's such a, the, I mean, the, there's an history of the I conflict. Know. And you cannot ask Inter to do it in their own time, because they won't. <laughs> So, we, so for anyone who, who knows uh, someone, we, we're really looking for funds. Yeah. 
to do this uh, di digitalization. Uh, uh, Are you trying to appeal to the Dutch <laughs> public? <here? laughs> Yeah, so, okay, so it's on your radar. The Kutsi University um, agreed to have the archive yeah. there, and I'm passing it okay. little by little. Good. It will be, I hope they will use it. Do you, have a, do you already have a successor in mind, or are you not thinking about that? Many, there many. are many, many. In mind there are many successors. Okay. We try to prepare them. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so are there questions in the audience? Yes. I'll keep it. <laughs> we always hold the mic. Just a question. If I am right, there are more than two types of law applying to uh, the residents of Israel and the territories. Not only the, crim the military law and the standard Israeli law, but also Ottoman, British. Oh, what is the situation now? Well, there are many layers of laws. And it seems that the uh, laws were chosen according to the interests, the immediate interests. For instance, the Ottoman law is being used in order to acquire lands that are not used by the Palestinians and to pass it as a state land and then to give it to the settlers. Uh, the British law is the basis of all the occupation laws that applies also in Israel for administrative detentions, for hard demolitions, for uh, expulsions, etc., And uh, there is a modern military law for the occupied territories that issues orders by orders by orders, not by a, a, a military governor issues these orders in order to run the occupation properly. And then there is the Israeli law for the Israelis. And then the Israeli law also applies to those settlers who live in the occupied territories, but they are Israeli citizens, or if they're not citizens, they are Jews. That's, in so many words, what the law says. And Arabs in Israel, which law applies to Arabs in Israel are under the Israeli law. No, but it, when, what Leah is trying to say, because you're thinking with a constitutional law. But there's many countries where there's no constitution. And then the Israeli law is made of those layers. It's not that they're adding, you know, I mean, it's not that there's for them this law and for them this law. It's an, it's an addition. It's the way the law is created when there's no constitution, constitutional law. Uh, well, we never, we never do uh, follow-up discussions. That's for the yeah. bar. So yeah. yeah. So there was one woman here, I think. Oh, more. Oh, two, two, and then we have to wrap it up because it's really late Sunday night. Hello. Good evening. I just wonder if God be where one of your children or grandchildren would be attacked, would you be able to defend uh, the one who would attack them? It's a very, very important question, and it repeats itself again and again and again. And I keep asking myself also again and again. I hope it will not happen. I hope I'll not uh, be faced with such a conflict. I cannot promise you. Sorry. I'm happy I don't have to face it, but I cannot promise you. I uh, would like to ask, uh, For me, the problem always with what you, you call resistance, and I do understand what you mean to say to see it in the context, but that the attacks on civilians are, uh, yeah, well, they're not the idea of the Geneva, Geneva Conventions of a lawful combatants. And I saw some 15 years ago a documentary here about the Second Intifada, which I thought was very good. It was uh, about the dialogue conversation about those that Did, uh, were in this intifada and an uh, Israeli sergeant and he showed his fear and the shock that he thought might they really just come at us and want to kill us and there was also an understanding of some kind of cons consolation coming from the group of uh, participants in that intifada. How do you look at the situation now? Do you think that Palestinians in the West Bank do still believe or want to live with Israelis side by side, or do you think that is a lost cause too? I, uh, 
I'm not representing the Palestinians in the occupied territories. What I can tell you is that they, the, uh, formally there was an offer to the Israelis to withdraw from the occupied territories and have a two-state solution. Uh, it was not accepted. And uh, right now there is some tendency to say, if not a two-state solution, that one state for all these people with equality. Uh, these are now on the agenda, usually the two possible solutions, about um, attacks of civilians. Uh, I, I'm not, as I said before, and you heard it again, I'm not going to give a reply or marks to whoever does anything. I have my own opinions about it, but uh, as an Israeli, I'm not going to uh, morally criticize. Clear. If uh, I can add something. Yeah. Um, as an Israeli Jew, I often like to say, ask not where is the Palestinian Mandela, ask where is the Israeli de Klerk. <laughs> I, I just think that in, for me as an Israeli Jew, that's the question. For Palestinians, it might be the other question. I think that we each need to somehow assume moral, ethical, political responsibility for our own collectives or the collectives that are acting in our name. And I think the ideal situation is that everybody is doing that all the way around, but I can only really take that responsibility from my own position. Well, I think <laughs> it's been very clear that you are all taking <laughs> the responsibility. And uh, I really want to thank you for this uh, very inspiring film and Leah for this very inspiring uh, life so far. And also that you say, I'm an angry optimist because I'm gonna use that a hell of a lot of the time. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you.